Hi, my name is Chris Rainey, and I'll be continuing our series today in the book of Daniel. Today we'll be in chapters 7 and 8. The title of this message is The Ancient of Days and the Everlasting Kingdom. I also like to call this message Beast Mode because we're looking at two chapters in the Bible where there are numerous uh, strange beasts that appear in the text, and so we'll talk about what those things mean. Um, but to get started, uh, Daniel chapter 7, and as we've been going through the book of Daniel, actually, we've been introduced to a number of kingdoms and predictions about kingdoms, and I thought it would be helpful if we kind of talk a little bit about the kingdom of the United States and how people see the kingdom of the United States at this time in its history. Um, and I'm going to give you three different quotes from three different um, books. The first one is a book called The Twilight of a Great Civilization by Carl F.H. Henry. He was a, a Christian theologian of the 20th century. He wrote this book in 1988. Listen to what he says about the United States. He says a half century or a half generation ago, the pagans were still largely threatening at the gates of Western culture. Now the barbarians are plunging into the mainstream. As they seek to reverse the inherited intellectual and moral heritage of the Bible, we are engaged as never before in a rival conflict for the mind, the conscience, the will, the spirit, and the very selfhood of contemporary man. So Carl F.H. Henry, that was 1988, seeing uh, Western civilization in the twilight of its uh, history. The next book is written by Thomas Friedman and Michael Mandelbaum. Thomas Friedman is a New York Times foreign affairs correspondent, and Michael Mandelbaum is a political scientist. They are friends, and they wrote a book in 2011 called That Used to Be Us. And here's what Thomas Friedman told NPR uh, when he was being interviewed about his book. He said, there's no question we've lost our way. This problem started at the end of the Cold War. We made the biggest mistake a country and species can make. We misread our environment. We thought the Cold War was a victory and we could put up our feet. In fact, we had just unleashed two billion people just like us, people with our same aspirations, same capabilities. And just when we needed to be lacing up our shoes and running fast, we put our feet up. His point, Friedman, seems to be that the United States, at the end of the Cold War, thought we had won a victory that would then result in us being able to just enjoy the peace that would now descend upon the world. But what he said actually happened was we, we unleashed two billion people who were now free from the, the oppression of communism to participate in the economies of the world, and we really are now in a competition with many of these people. And so he calls the book, That Used to Be Us. In other words, we used to be able to do all these great things, but we, we are not anymore because we just sort of um, stopped doing what we did to get us or to make us successful. And then the last book I want to quote before we get into Daniel is a book called America's Expiration Date. It's written by a political commentator, Christian political commentator, Cal Thomas. It was written in 2020, just last year it came out. And uh, the book's full title is America's Expiration Date, The Fall of Empires and Superpowers and the Future of the United States. And in uh, Thomas's book, he says, and he studies various great civilizations, and he says that most empires last only about 250 years. And he points out um, that the United States is you know, gonna turn 245 this year. And so by the historical precedent, the United States could begin to be seeing the, the uh, decline of its position as a superpower. And all these things point to what I think is very clear in the book of Daniel is that kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. And God is superintending and watching over the affairs of men and directing them. And we're going to see uh, how that plays out here uh, today. So in chapter seven, it signals a major transition in the book because it goes from chapters one through six where Daniel and his friends are the primary characters and they are oppressed and they are um, you know, struggling because they've been brought from Judah into Babylon. They've been you know, political prisoners. They've been uh, forcibly removed from their homeland and placed in a new place in Babylon. But they have thrived because they have continued to put God first in their lives. And despite every effort by you know, the, the state government to oppress them, they keep landing on their feet. And that was exactly the case last week with Daniel in the lion's den. Uh, the, so the first 
half of the book is about him and his friends and their relationship with the state and the kings. And now we're going to get to chapter 7 through 12, where it's what we call apocalyptic visions, Daniel's visions of the future. And these uh, writings, as I said, are called apocalyptic, and that means unveiling. So what we're seeing is an unveiling of the future. It might be the immediate future that is now historically past, or it might even be the future that is even beyond our time and day. Um, the last thing I'll say in, in, in introduction here is that this is where many people start predicting specific timelines for history's unfolding, uh, which is problematic. And one of the most famous examples of that occurred from someone just in, the, in our next door neighboring state, New York State. It's very surprising that you would find a um, maybe a person who would predict a coming of the Lord uh, from upstate New York. But uh, in the 1800s, uh, William Miller, who had fought in the War of 1812, and gone back to become a farmer and converted to Christianity um, after he got back from the war and began reading the Bible. And he discovered um, a verse in Daniel that said, uh, it's actually Daniel 8, 14, one of the passages we're gonna be looking at, unto 2300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And in his, in his reading and in the commentary he was using along with it, uh, it said that he should understand that to be years and that he should understand that to have been written about 457 AD. So he added 2,300 uh, years to it, the 2,300 days and evenings, or, or days, and concluded that, as he said here, I was thus brought to the solemn conclusion that in about 25 years from that time, all the affairs of our present state would be wound up. So he understood that Jesus was going to come back in 1843. He further refined himself as he continued to study his view that it would be the Hebrew year, so it was March 1843 to March 1844. He did this in his private study, and then he began to tell his friends about it, and word spread about his, his views, and he began to be invited to speak in churches, and he became very significant and influential in that time. And so uh, he was able to convince many people that Jesus was gonna return in 1843 or 44, uh, didn't happen as he as we would expect and then uh, his followers though were not dismayed and they they actually did some further studies and concluded that it he had missed it uh, for a couple of technical reasons and then it would actually be October 22nd 1844 so people gathered around to wait for that day to happen and as it turns out again Jesus did not return and Miller uh, goes down as the uh, person who was uh, instrumental in what we call the Great Disappointment, the Great Disappointment of 1844, where Jesus did not return according to his understanding of a prophecy from Daniel chapter 8. Um, his followers, though, weren't, were not going to be dismayed, and so they, they continued to um, research this and concluded that the cleansing that Daniel talks about actually occurred on October 22nd, 1844, in heaven, and so... Um, it actually happened, according to them, and they concluded that they were also to begin worshiping God on the, on the Sabbath day, the Jewish Sabbath, not the Christian Sabbath, and so they became what we now call the Seventh-day Adventist movement. So they all, all this movement started out of this, this prediction of Jesus returning that did not happen, the great disappointment. So let's get into the text and see uh, what we can understand from Daniel 7. So it says in Daniel 7, beginning in verse number one, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea and four great beasts came up out of the sea different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, and devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. 
It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So let's talk a little bit about the similarities between Daniel chapter 7 and 8. Uh, first of all, what we're going to see is that the animals, the beasts are, you know, that are represented by animals, all represent political kingdoms or political entities. So that's one thing that we're going to see as we go through this. Also, we're going to note that in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel uh, indicates he had a dream. Uh, in the dream, then he sees himself having visions, but it is a dream in chapter 7. In chapter 8, they are purely uh, visions of the future. And then in, uh, in chapter 7, we see what I would call hybrid animals or, or animals that are mixed. Um, a lion with eagle's wings, for example. So they're hybrids and they have some, somewhat of a grotesque appearance, whereas in chapter uh, 8, the animals are more normal, although they all have horns. And I think we can say horns are, are symbols of power. And I think that plays into how we would look at that. Um, so the themes are related in both chapters. Uh, both chapters have these, these animals representing kingdoms. And if we look at the, the uh, diagram that you should see on your screen now, uh, the four kingdoms are tied into what we saw in Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2. So there's a consistent theme here. Um, we see in chapter 2, the head of gold corresponds to the lion in chapter 7. There's no corresponding item in, in chapter 8, and it's identified with Babylon, who was the preeminent power from 626 to 539. Uh, the second item in from Daniel 2, chest and arms of silver, uh, corresponds to the bear of chapter 7, corresponding to the ram of chapter 8, and that's the Medo-Persian Empire. And then the belly and thighs of bronze of Daniel chapter 2 corresponds to the leopard of chapter 7, the goat of chapter 8, uh, that uh, represents Greece and the rise of Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire. And then finally, uh, the legs of iron, uh, which corresponds to a terrifying and frightening beast in Daniel 7, which we think corresponds to Rome overall. And then uh, finally, there are feet of clay mixed with iron, which doesn't correspond to any of the uh, other chapters here. Um, and we think that's going to occur in the future. So let's look at chapter 7 now in more detail. Um, the coming kingdom of God. And what we see happen here in verse 1 of chapter 7 is that Daniel's vision is set by the sea. And... It says the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And by this time in, in uh, history, the ancient Near East, um, the sea was a potent symbol of chaos. People looked at the sea. It was very mysterious what was underneath it. It was dark. And so there, were, there, were, um, there, there was a view that it was, it was a threatening force that raged against the people and the forces of creation. So the sea was very mysterious and it was very chaotic as far as people understood. And so out of this kind of chaos, we see these beasts emerging. And um, evil empires and systems thrive in chaos because they offer a seemingly stable and secure place for people to be. So despite all of the um, problems with say communism, for example, it, it was stable because it was there was a government in power even though if it was not the best form of government, but it was a stable place for people, and so oftentimes people prefer that to the chaos that can be when there is no government. Um, and Adam Clark said in his commentary, the beasts arrive out of a stormy and tempestuous sea, that is, out of the wars and commotions of the world, and they are called great in comparison of other states and kingdoms, and are denominated beasts for their tyrannical and cruel oppression. So the beasts rise up out of chaos and the explanation, I think, for how they're able to gain a following and represent empires is that people at least find them to be stable and they, they will follow along. So there's four beasts in Daniel 7 and verses 3 through 8 that uh, rise up. Um, as I said earlier, the lion with the eagle's wings seems to represent Nebuchadnezzar's uh, humbling and then his restoration. The, the wings of the eagle are plucked off as Nebuchadnezzar's Sanity was plucked away from him. A bear with three ribs representing Medo-Persia. The leopard with four wings and heads representing the kingdom of Greece and Alexander the Great. 
and then a terrifying and dreadful beast in verse 7 with uh, iron teeth and ten horns seems to represent Rome. Now what we're going to see though is that much of the language of Revelation appears later in the or in Daniel appears later in the book of Revelation and so we believe that these things while they speak to an immediate kingdom uh, that's that will be out just beyond the future in, in Daniel's day we also see a, a subsequent future event happening um, in our future sometimes related to these events um, the next thing that happens in the in the text is in verses 9 through 12 and the ancient of days comes and judges the beastly kingdom. So it says, as I looked, thrones were placed and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out before him. A thousand thousand served him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So what we see happen here is that the kingdoms of this world are summoned before the uh, what we might call the court of the Ancient of Days. Uh, and then the Ancient of Days, it says, comes in and... Uh, almost as if the judge comes in to be seated before the court. The Ancient of Days comes in and we see the, the white hair representing his purity and it, his throne is uh, surrounded by fiery flames and it says a stream of fire issued and came out from before him. So it is, it is like when God descended on Mount, Mount Sinai to give the law to the people of Israel. Uh, it says that that God descended on the mountain in fire. And what we see is this fire, again, representing or, or surrounding God on his throne. And the beast that was so boastful, the horn, uh, the, the three horns that, were, that rose up in place of the 10 horns, uh, beast, he is killed and thrown into the fire. And I find this, this irony that the, the three Hebrews were thrown into the fire of Nebuchadnezzar and not burned, when a, a, when a fourth, like a son of man, came and joined them and protected them from the fire, and yet the beast with the horn is thrown into the fire dead and is destroyed. Um, the other beasts in this example lose their rule and their reign, but they are permitted to live for a time. So God, the Ancient of Days, who comes on the scene, is in control of these empires who had risen in the world, he is able to put them down and control them, determining how long they have and determining whether at the, what point they will end. So the Ancient of Days judges the boasting beast and limits the other beast. And after the courtroom scene, another dramatic thing happens here. Let's look at verses 13 and 14 to see what that says. It says, I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, these, there came one like a son of man and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So here we see one like a son of man will rule over the beastly kingdoms. Now, in the New Testament, the word son of man or the phrase son of man occurs over 80 times, and nearly every single one of them refers to Jesus Christ and clearly designates his humanity. And let's hear what he had to say in Matthew 24, 30. He said, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. Then all the tribes of earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So here, Jesus refers back to Daniel 7, 13 and 14 and says, basically that I am the Son of Man that you're going to see coming on the clouds of glory and exercising dominion and power and authority. So Jesus is the Son of Man who will rule and reign over all the kingdoms of the earth. So when we put our hope and our trust in Him instead of the kingdoms of the world, we are doing what, what we should do because it is wisdom to trust in God and not the kingdoms of this world because the kingdoms of this world have an expiration date to use uh, the term of Cal, uh, Cal Thomas earlier. 
So that's chapter 7, um, 1 through 14. Then we get to chapter 5, or 7, 15 to 28, and we see um, a little bit more. It goes back in time and, and talks a bit more about the interpretation of Daniel's dream and kind of goes through the same sequence again. Uh, one quote I do want to make note is, you know, how do, we, how do all of these people follow the beast, the little horn, that was so boastful and arrogant. And uh, Trimper Longman uh, says this, uh, because what we, what we actually find here is that this horn in verse 22, made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given for the saints. So the, so the, the horn makes war with the saints of God and is prevailing over the people of God for a time. And how is the, the horn so successful at gaining a movement to overwhelm the people of God? And, and uh, Tripper Longman says, individual sinners are harmful sometimes deeply, but sinners bound together behind a group cause can cause great devastation. Nationalism, racism, sexism, denominationalism, factionalism, great evil can arise when sinners come together with a common purpose against someone outside of their group, the other. We can depersonalize the other, they aren't quite human, and so to harm the other is not quite the same as hurting one of our own. And this sounds a lot like our day when we are very divided, when we are ripe for a boasting horn type of leader to come and gain a worldwide following. And this will allow him to wear out the saints in verse 25, uh, is what it says. It says he will wear out the saints until his dominion is taken away. So this bodes you know, somewhat ominous for the, the people of faith because it indicates to us that there, there may very well come times of great uh, oppression and people in the world and other parts of the world are certainly experiencing this now and they would say that they're experiencing this very thing that Daniel describes and it could very well come our way as well. Uh, so chapter seven ends and two years later, Daniel sees another vision in chapter eight uh, again, this is going back to the third year of Belshazzar. So we've gone back in time in chapter seven and eight to prior to Darius, which was, who was the king in chapter six. Um, we're, we're back in the reign of Belshazzar when Daniel actually had these uh, visions. So in chapter eight, in verses nine through 14, uh, I'm gonna skip ahead because we go through another um, series of uh, beasts, uh, animals, ram, male goat, and then a little horn that grows exceedingly great. And I think in verses uh, 9 through 14, we're going to see that identified with Antiochus Epiph Epiphanes and then um, potentially the Antichrist in 23 to 27. So let's read verses 9 through 14 to get a feel for what uh, Daniel predicts. He says, Out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, toward the glorious land. It grew even... It grew great even to the hosts of heaven. And some of the hosts and some of the stars threw it down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the, burnt, and the regular burnt offering was taken away from him and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering because of transgression. And it will throw truth to the ground and it will act and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking and another holy one said to the one who spoke, for how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, for 2300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful place. Now, this proud little horn uh, that is described here seems to refer to Antiochus Epiphanes, who was a Syrian king uh, from 175 to 164 BC. So what Daniel seems to be predicting here now, and again, we are probably at 553 BC when Daniel is predicting this, he's predicting something 400 years out. And it, historically, what happened with Antiochus Epiphanes lines up with what Daniel predicted in verses nine through 14. And that is to say that uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, Epiphany means a manifestation, and the idea is that he's a, you know, he was a self-proclaimed manifestation of God. And um, he led the, his people to desecrate the temple of Jerusalem in 167. They desecrated um, the Torah. They had them burned and, and destroyed. 
They, they, they disallowed the observance of Shabbat, Sabbath, and festivals of the Jews, and they set up worship of the Greek gods. And finally, they also offered Jews only two options, to convert to paganism or to die. So he was a terrible ruler, very violent and uh, very difficult for the Jewish people to survive under. However, there was a Jewish resistant movement led by the Maccabees, Judas Maccabee, and he and his fighters miraculously defeated the uh, Syrians in two major battles, and that was uh, the miracle of Hanukkah occurs as part of that. And so the Jewish people today remember Hanukkah, and that's what they're remembering. They're remembering the defeat of Antiochus Epiphanes. Jesus later, later referred to the abomination that causes desolation, which we know that Antiochus Epiphanes did um, by offering a, a pig on the altar. And yet we also see Jesus speaking about it in the future as well. And so a second type of Antiochus Epiphanes will occur. And that's where we get down to verses 23 to 27. Let's read what it says. And I think this refers to what we know as the Antichrist of, of the future. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. And he shall cause fearful destruction and, and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand. And in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many and he even shall rise up against the prince of princes and he shall be broken but not by human hand the vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true but seal up the vision for it refers to many days from now and i daniel was overcome and lay sick for some days then i rose and went about the king's business but i was appalled by the vision and i did not understand it so there daniel is predicting several uh, very challenging things. A strong and crafty, uh, crafty king will have a measure of supernatural power, and will, but he will be destroyed by divine power. We read that in those verses. His success and exaltation of himself uh, over against the prince shows that he is the little horn of uh, verses 8, 9 through 12, at least a, a later version of that little horn. And he persecutes uh, God's people, um, which recalls chapter 7, 21 and 25. Uh, and the evenings and the mornings have to do with the length of time before the sanctuary is restored. So something in the future is going to happen, a, an antichrist type of person, and um, yet God is going to squelch this uprising as well in his timing. So, wow, that was a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of deep stuff there about the future, uh, and you know, historically ahead of Daniel's time, which is now in our past, and the future that is future to us as well. So what should we conclude about these things? Are we in an apocalyptic situation ourselves? And for this, I'm going to uh, quote from an article by Malcolm Mugridge. He was a Christian writer, and, and he wrote an article called Living Through an Apocalypse, and it was published in Christianity Today magazine in 1974, but it sounds relevant today. and Let's hear what he said. Even so, let me boldly and plainly say that it has long seemed to me clear beyond any shadow of doubt that what is still called Western civilization is in an advanced stage of decomposition and that another dark age will soon be upon us, if indeed it has not already begun. With the media, especially television, governing all our lives, as they indubitably do, it is easily imaginable that this might happen without our noticing. I was reading the other day about a distasteful but significant experiment conducted in some laboratory or other. A number of frogs were put into a bowl of water and the water very gradually rise to the boiling point with the result that all expired without making any serious effort to jump out of the bowl. The frogs are us, the water is our habitat, and the media, by accustoming us to the gradual deterioration of our values and our circumstances, ensure that the boiling point comes upon us unawares. It is my own emphatic opinion that boiling point is upon us now, and as a matter of urgency, Christians must decide how they should conduct themselves in the face of so apocalyptic a situation. So Muggeridge pointing out 
1974 that he saw us living in an advanced state of decomposition in our society. And I can only say that, in my opinion, it has only progressed and advanced from that time. So what should we do in response to the apocalyptic situation that it appears we find ourselves in? The advice of Daniel 8.25 tells us to look for a stone that was not cut by a human hand. In 8.25 it says, And he shall even rise up against the prince of princes, referring to the beast, or the, the little horn, and he shall be broken but by no human hand. So a human hand is not going to destroy him. Maybe a divine hand. And Daniel 2.34 is the origin of that, of that phrase, by no human hand. And it says, As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on the, its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. So what we see here is this image of a stone that was not cut by a human hand destroying the kingdoms of this world at the end of time. So we should look for a stone that was not cut by a human hand. But I think you may be sensing now what that stone is and who that stone is because we read in the New Testament that we can embrace a stone and it can become the cornerstone of our life. Jesus said, have you not read the scripture, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Uh, in Acts 4.11, the early church said, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And in 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5, Peter said, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men in the sight of God and chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So in our decomposing times, in our apocalyptic times in which we live, the advice that I think this word of God gives us is that we can embrace the stone the stone that can either be a stumbling stone if you do not trust in Christ or the stone upon which you can base your life if you do trust him. This is, I believe, what we need to do in these end times is continue to build our hope not on the kingdoms of this world, not on the, the wise men of our age, not in the power structures that exist in our world because they are going to be dismantled, but put our trust in the living stone and he will protect us and guide us. So let me pray for you right now and thank you for joining us today. Father, thank you so much that we've been allowed this opportunity to read these very uh, difficult passages because there's so much imagery and so many things that, that are not easy to comprehend. And I just ask you to help us as we wrestle with these things and as we wrestle with the times in which we live. Lord, help us not to put our trust in things that will not last, in things that are temporary, which is what so many things around us is, but help us to trust in the things that last, to things that are permanent. And we know that we can trust in Jesus as the cornerstone of our lives and that he will be a firm footing for us in these, in these treacherous times that we, which we live. Thank you so much for giving us this word today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you and thank you for joining us.